So I am Josh Farwell, aka Fondue. I only mention the hacker name because there are people in the community who like can't seem to remember my real name, but they can remember Fondue. So that's what we're going with. Um, I'm a security engineer at uh, New Relic. Um, I work. I split my time between a few things. Um, I work on Linux security. Uh, I uh, work on building visibility tools, and I do some purple teaming, which is what I call it when I do red teaming, but I'm looking at the source code. Um, and I have a former life as a Linux sysadmin and an SRE, um, and that really informs kind of my approach to uh, breaking stuff. Uh, I really like finding implementation problems. I like finding bad practices. Uh, finding bugs is cool too, but uh, yeah, people people make some cool mistakes uh, if you know where to look. And uh, yeah, I really like breaking computers. I like building stuff, and uh, I'm kind of new at breaking stuff. I think I've only been really focusing on it for about a year, um, but uh, already uh, had a lot of fun and found some cool stuff. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about it. Um, so can I get a show of hands? Um, who here is familiar with the basics of how Docker works in Linux? Everybody here is familiar. Okay, cool, we're gonna blow right past this then. So, uh, TLDR, a, uh, a container is basically just a set of namespaces that the kernel provides to a set of processes. Um, if you are interested in looking into these, these are the names of things that you can look into. Um, I think the, uh, the big ones are C groups, um, which uh, contain processes in uh, a group um, and give them resource limitations. So that's memory, CPU, and IO lim limitations, not disk space, just IO. Uh, network namespace, um, which is uh, basically uh, the, the Linux uh, network stack lets you pretend like you are running your own interface, um, and then it transparently will forward ports from the host into the container namespace. Um, and uh, the uh, virtualized file system, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, so uh, it uh, gives you a, a uh, layered file system um, with, uh, yeah, and <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's basically a ch root with more features. With a ch root, you would uh, put that file system in a directory on a Linux host. Um, with containers, we often do more tricky stuff. Uh, we have overlayFS from Docker. Um, I've seen people use QCow. I've seen people use hard links, and I've seen people use LVM volumes that they add to. What is Docker? So Docker and containers are not synonymous. Docker is a set of tools around Linux containers. Um, and uh, it is a Linux daemon that uh, will start up and shut down run C containers and configure them and do stuff for them. Uh, it is a command line client, which is basically an HTTP client. Uh, and uh, it is image management with overlay file systems, um, including tooling around uh, storing and pulling those images. And uh, there are many prepackaged images available in Docker Hub. And I think the big selling point with Docker is the ease of use and the velocity. Um, you can tell a developer, hey, I have put my open source stuff in a Docker container. It's already set up for you. You don't have to do an installation. You don't have to manage dependencies. You don't have to configure anything. You can just do Docker run my thing, and it'll just run. Um, this helps people uh, get developers to engage with their products. And uh, it's really, really useful. But doing things that way has some implications. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we're gonna talk about why that may not be a great idea. Um, Docker prides itself on being very easy to automate. Uh, all of the things are done at the command line. Uh, you can uh, really get rolling with just a few bash scripts. And uh, there's a lot of tooling around uh, Docker for orchestrating uh, production environments. So like uh, uh, tooling around getting the containers to hosts and running the daemon on multiple hosts and managing clusters of services. Docker is historically a pain point for security. Um, the Docker project kind of made some mistakes in their early days. Uh, some issues with uh, the idea of like uh, access is authorization, I've heard people say, um, meaning do they don't put authentication on important APIs, uh, such as the Docker daemon API and the Docker registry API. Uh, segmentation and access control are challenging in Docker environments because of how dynamic everything is. Uh, you have a service and you have like a big cluster of hosts. Uh, sometimes those clusters are in different uh, cloud environments or different uh, geographic locations and uh, that system, those services can spin up on any host in the cluster. Uh, and uh, so managing network segmentation in a traditional way, the way that I was used to back in the day when I was a Linux sysadmin, is very difficult. Um, Modern implementations have fixed some of these issues. Um, there's better access control these days. Uh, there's better control over container processes. 
um, and uh, there is uh, better controls for uh, Docker image uh, management um, with Docker Notary, um, but it's still a pen tester gold mine. Um, the kernel is a huge attack surface for Docker still. Um, Alex talked about that, I think, a little bit uh, in the previous talk. Um, and the container escapes and attacking the kernel really has a high impact. Um, Docker registries and image management are not handled well by default. Uh, by default, you download a registry and you start running it and uh, there's no authentication, there's no authorization, there's no hookups. It just, you just push stuff to there and pull stuff from there. And that can be problematic when it's your package registry. <laughs> um, and uh, developers will Docker pull anything. You can trick developers into Docker pulling things that they probably shouldn't pull. Um, and uh, people build automation around these insecure practices. Um, they build process around these workflows that have problems. Um, and uh, people are still finding new issues with Docker, um, particularly this summer, I think Alex demoed um, some issues with uh, Docker for Windows. Um, and it seems like, you know, the Docker project will focus in one area of security, do a really good job, um, and then kind of move on to the next thing, um, and they still haven't gotten to everything yet. Cool. We're gonna talk about the basics of using client, just for uh, some context for the stuff I'm gonna do later. Um, Docker build. Uh, what we do is uh, we can build Docker images on our local system using Docker files, which I will get into in a minute. Docker build is the command to do this. Um, Docker PS will list things on a Docker host, uh, list the containers that are running. Uh, Docker pull will pull a, uh, an image from a registry. Um, in this case, we're pulling Ubuntu from the Docker Hub registry, and this is actually a shorthand for library slash Ubuntu as a path. Um, this is also not great that they do this. Uh, and uh, Docker run, um, the dash IT uh, is basically an interactive TTY. So um, e that will launch it as a shell that you can actually work with at the command line. Um, if you have a running container and you want to do stuff in it, you do Docker exec IT, um, which, uh, and then pass it the container ID, um, which is a hash. Um, and uh, Docker commit will actually allow you to save something that's in a running container to an image, which is really, really cool. Um, tags, Docker uses tags to manage images. Uh, an image doesn't really have a name, it has a tag. It can have multiple tags. This is how you chain, uh, add a tag to a given container. Um, and Docker push will put it into a registry. And you can think of a registry as basically a uh, package repository in Linux. It's not any different. Like, you pull down binaries and then run them. Um, Linux folks have a lot of tools and ideas around how to do this safely. Um, namely, they put signatures on things uh, and they, uh, they guard those keys with their life. Um, Docker folks don't do that and it's exploitable. We'll talk about Docker files really quick. Um, this is an example of a Docker file that I wrote for, I think I was doing some uh, SDR stuff with this. Um, I think the important things to note here are the from, that is the base container that we are importing. So we import that image and then we build on top of that image. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's basically a script. It's very similar to like config management scripts or a bash script that you might uh, run to, uh, to bootstrap a system. Um, right here I'm installing a bunch of packages. And uh, down below, we will have uh, one of two or both um, entries called CMD and entry point. These are important. These are Docker. Uh, this is what the Docker container. Entry point is a, a, a binary or a, a, a program that Docker runs when the container starts. And CMD is a default argument, the first argument that you pass to the container when you run or run stuff. So you can have it, uh, if you have a container that's for a service, a lot of times people will put in CMD the instantiation of their service and uh, then they don't put anything in the Docker run, you just do Docker run container, it knows what the CMD is and will run it. Workflows, and I'm gonna talk about this uh, because I think it's important to understand the context of how people are using Docker. Um, we have two styles here. These are just example workflows. Um, YOLO style, so a developer is on their machine, they're working on their service, they don't really wanna mess with writing a Docker file, so they just you know, get a shell in the container, do stuff, uh, and then hit uh, Docker commit, save the image, and then push it directly to production host and drop mine, done, right? You can do this with Docker, it works. The reason it works is because Docker container running on your local system is going to basically run the same on the production system. 
with some caveats. Uh, the runtime uh, configuration does matter, uh, particularly if you're doing like volumes, trying to pass in host uh, file system resources to the container. Uh, but in general, like you can get away with just like committing an image and pushing it out. Uh, not a good idea. Um, enterprise ready style. Um, most of the time people write Docker files into their source code, they'll put it like in the root directory for that given service, that given project. Um, they'll push their stuff into their source code repository like Git or GitHub Enterprise. Um, that will kick off a build using Git hooks as an example. Um, the build, a lot of people use Jenkins for this. Jenkins will pull in the source code, it will build it, uh, and then it will push the container image it built into a container registry. And then the build will kick off a deployment um, with the container orchestration. And then the container orchestration layer, whether that's uh, Docker Swarm, Kubernetes is used, though that's not exactly Docker, but it can run Docker containers. Um, uh, and there are plenty of others. Uh, people also write their own in Bash or Terraform or whatever um, using, using uh, system D to run containers as services. Um, there's lots of different options, um, but that's generally how it works. So CI builds it, pushes it in a registry, kicks off a deploy, the deploy pulls that image down. Right. I'm getting to the good stuff. Oh, here, here's the good stuff. Let's break some stuff. So um, one of the things that I found in Docker environments is that people are still making the same old mistakes. Um, the Docker host daemon is one of the first places to look if you're doing an engagement with someone you know runs Docker, right? Um, it is an HTTP interface over a Unix domain socket. This is weird, it's kind of weird. Um, the reason they did this was because it used to be bound to a TCP socket, port 2375, um, and uh, they do have authentication as an option, but it didn't come on by default. Um, and they found that people don't actually use it. <laughs> so they moved it to var run docker sock. Um, and this is what uh, the local Docker client uh, uses to talk to the Docker daemon. Um, doc, var run docker sock is usually owned by a Docker group um, and has read write permissions for Docker group. Uh, so if you put a user in the Docker group, they can just do stuff with it. Um, this is problematic and can result in uh, privilege escalation problems. Um, if we do right here, the Docker socket has rights to do a whole lot of stuff on the host. Um, it, can, it can basically do whatever it wants if you tell it to. Um, in this case, we're telling it to run in privilege mode, which means running as root. Um, and we are mounting slash to a directory called slash host root inside the container. And then uh, we're gonna cat at C shadow from the host. Um, now, this is great as a local privilege escalation bug. Um, a lot of people do configure their systems like this, and people don't rec realize what they're doing. I've seen folks like put in sudoers file, uh, you know, sudo docker run star with no password, <laughs> and then they mask other things and make you use a password for them when this is exactly the same as running sudo without a password. The jury is out. Some people disagree on whether or not that's a good idea. I personally don't think it's a good idea. This is how you find those things on your network. So um, I'm actually running uh, nmap here. Um, this is a, a Python library that pulls in nmap and gives you out JSON um, just for convenience. Um, and what we're doing here is we're just scanning for port 2375 on a given target network. And then um, we're using the Docker API client. And um, the cool thing about this is if we have version auto as a flag, And um, that will work for all of the older versions of the daemon. Um, the, the library will figure out which uh, API call to make. Um, and that ping, CLI ping, um, if you can successfully do that and you get a return 200, that means you can do code execution on that host. It's done, done deal, right? So uh, this is how you look for those. Run this in your next engagement, see if you can find stuff. I may or may not have run this on the internet. I may have found stuff. I'm gonna to touch on Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac a little bit. Um, this is what most developers use on their local machines. Um, Alex went into some great stuff with Docker for Windows. Uh, I believe he was demonstrating um, CVE 2018-15514, um, which is Stephen Seeley's work. Um, both of these attacks, uh, there, there's also a great uh, a talk at Black Hat in 2017 about attacking the TCP socket using LLMNR uh, host rebinding attacks. Um, and these are both just attacking the Docker API. 
Um, if you're interested in doing deep persistence inside of developer machines, um, the Black Hat talk actually talks about some post-exploitation stuff that's really great. Um, they essentially uh, mount the Linux VM that's running on these systems, they mount that, uh, the, the root there and do an infection of the VM and then continually start infecting containers in the local registry which is pretty sweet. Um, and these do run as VMs. Um, they originally ran as virtual box VMs, which was a poor choice. Um, they now use uh, native operating system APIs to run as a VM. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Docker for Mac actually seems pretty good. I've poked at it pretty hard, I use it. Um, the isolation between the VM and host uh, seems fairly robust. The network isolation seems fairly robust. And uh, you can't really mount anything good on the OS X host into the container. Uh, it masks slash system and slash library and all of those good things. Um, and uh, you touch the host with uh, your own UID and GID. So if I'm running the Docker daemon as Josh, that's the only rights that uh, the containers will have on the host file system, um, unlike Linux. Right. Docker registries. And this I'm a little bit ticked off about, to be perfectly honest. Um, and the reason I'm ticked off is because Docker registries are problematic by default. They don't really prompt you to set up authentication, or at least they haven't until very, very recently. Um, and they will actually sell you a version of the registry that uses Docker Notary, has the keys all set up, they'll support you in doing that, and uh, and and it has an LDAP integration all set up. Um, but uh, if you want to do that on your own, you're, you are, you're on your own. And uh, you kind of have to figure it out. And uh, the thing that I've learned is that engineers don't really have a good reason to figure it out often. Um, or uh, they don't really think of this in the same way they think about package repositories or source code. They, the, their, their internal threat model doesn't match up. And so if you go and kind of let them run rampant, they'll just set these up and you can just push to them. Um, and uh, there's no signatures on any of the images. They're hashed, so you can compare hashes by yourself. The system doesn't actually support this until fairly, until fairly recently, it didn't support any uh, signature or trust verification of images. Um, and uh, the best part of these is that they often straddle corporate and prod networks because in order to enable developer workflows where they need to pull down containers and push up containers from their local systems, uh, but the orchestration needs to pull containers in order to deploy them, so the easy way to deal with that is to stick it on both, and people do that. It's bad. How do we enumerate vulnerable registries? This is a pretty good curl. This one will work. Um, there's also a version one of the registry. Um, you can check out the documentation for the API there. Um, I will show you here. This is what that returns. It just returns like an empty hash there um, if you hit it on slash v2. Um, and uh, we want to see if we can push there, right? Um, what we're trying to do is overwrite an existing image with an image of our own. Um, and uh, this is how we test that. We can tag a local image. Ubuntu is really easy. I have that on my machine. So we're tagging it with the uh, target uh, domain name slash some path slash some container name. Um, and we'll push it. And uh, if you can push there, you can likely push over existing tags. Um, and what I found is that when you uh, do the push, it will push it up, and then it will check if you're authorized, if it's even doing that at all. This is an example of what it looks like to push. As you can see, I'm running a registry locally for testing. Um, and uh, so the Docker run at the top is just me starting up a registry. It's bound to port 5000 so we can check it out. Um, I check to make sure that the registry is there. I uh, tag a container with a tag that will push to that registry. And I try it. And this is what it looks like. It pushes up each uh, layer of the overlay FS and shows the hash. And then we'll show the hash for the whole image at the end. Um, and uh, if I want to check to see if it's there, I do uh, the container name slash tags slash list, and I can see that it's there. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the uh, other way to uh, take a look at this is to look at slash catalog. Um, this will show you just a big list of all of the containers that are in that registry. 
Um, and uh, you can start looking at names and picking stuff to infect. Um, it does some pagination, and I've run into issues with uh, performance every once in a while, where like a Docker registry will stop responding to me <laughs> and start timing out. Um, so it may take you a little while, um, but uh, if you've got some time, you can just sit in a network and hit this a bunch um, and get the whole list of stuff. So we have a registry. We know what tags are there. That's great. What do we push to? How do we know what to push to? Because it's not so simple as just, oh, I'm going to pick a container that says authorization in it or uh, you know, pick a service and try to infect that service that I'm targeting. Um, because of how the CI works and how the images get pushed up and in what order, um, it's very likely that uh, if you are pushing to like a latest tag in Docker, that it will get overwritten by someone else, someone who's trying to deploy things. Um, and uh, this is kind of a, a representation of when that happens. Um, the orchestration is only going to deploy your new stuff when a uh, deploy is kicked off, um, so uh, when a new build has happened and a new image is ready for you, um, or when a service is adding more instances, it will pull. Um, and uh, a new image is pushed to that registry um, right after the build is done, right? So if we are putting in a side channel image um, and trying to get it infected, uh, and someone goes and makes a commit and does new build, um, it will push to right over your new tag and then deploy it, and then your stuff doesn't get deployed, which is lame. Good for us. People use base containers, which is great. So this is a very common use pattern. It's falling out of favor for a lot of reasons, um, and this is one good reason for it to fall out of favor. Um, uh, they are often imported in the from, in the beginning of the Docker file. And what people will do is uh, the SREs will sit down and go, well, people are using all of this time, you know, just getting their basic container set up and getting their dependencies put in. We want to make it easy for them. So we're going to make a base container that has all of the things that they might need and knows the things that we want it to do for our uh, orchestration to work right. And uh, everyone will save time, and it'll be great. What actually happens is that these base containers then just immediately get stale, like immediately. And uh, changing them becomes problematic because you have all of these disparate services that depend on them, and you don't know what those disparate services need from that base container. Um, and uh, if we push into a base container as an attacker and push to that tag, what will happen is, is that when someone does a build on a service, um, the CI will go, oh, okay, that's that base container. I'll pull down that image. They pull it down, and then it will add to that image in the build and then push it back to the services tag, which means that our uh, exploits are like in the middle of that image. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this works really, really well. Um, and it's really easy to find these containers. You just look for things with base in the name. Like everyone puts base <laughs> in the name of their base containers. Um, particularly, they'll put like their company name there. <laughs> so if you see it, you know, company name slash base Ubuntu, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, and the best thing is, is that you don't need to guess. If you have the time, you can just start pulling down containers from the registry and look in the Docker files. If you open up those containers, the Docker files are probably going to be right there. And you can just look and start seeing what people are importing and you can very easily identify a good tag to push to. Or you could just infect everything. There's no reason not to uh, on some level. I, I, I think that it's really, really easy to set up a bash script that just starts pulling down containers and infecting them. And uh, it kind of doesn't matter whether or not a bunch of them get overwritten if a few of them don't. Right. It's a little bit louder, but it would work. Um, we're going to talk about the malware that we're actually putting in these things. Um, because of a, lot of a lot of our normal Linux persistence tricks don't work very well, I found. Um, we don't have any in it or any services running in most containers. Some people do, but you don't know who's going to and who's not, and you don't know how they're going to do it. So you don't know whether you need to write to slash, slash etsy slash system D, or whether you need to write to slash etsy slash init D. It, it, it really depends on what they're doing in their CMD and entry point. So I don't bother with that. Um, we can't do kernel modules either, um, because uh, unless you're doing really crazy stuff, uh, you can't really load kernel modules into the host kernel from a container. And that kernel is the host kernel, right? Um, and uh, shell and profile injection are finicky. I've had issues with this. It 
reasonable to assume that they would work, and I may not have been able to just get it right, um, but uh, I, I was not able to get it to fire things that were in the profile. Um, it had trouble. Um, and uh, we could put something in CMD, an entry point, you know, just make the CMD run evil thing dot sh. Um, but uh, CMD might get overwritten by the person who runs a container, and entry point might get stomped on by whoever is building on top of your base container. So not great. Um, I went for infecting Linux software instead, which sounds hard. It's not hard. Um, Musil and glibc. Uh, Musil being a, a, a libc alternative used in Alpine, which is a very popular container that people use. Um, uh, glibc being glibc. Um, uh, it's an option to do that. I don't understand those libraries very well. You could very easily like identify a part of that library that always gets loaded and put your stuff in there. I just went for the shell binary because I know it runs <laughs> and it's simple <laughs> and not hard to figure out. Um, bin ash is run in Alpine. Um, bin dash is what Ubuntu uses. Um, there's actually a link from bin sh to bin dash. Um, and you could also do bash, um, which is also very popular. Um, and uh, it's important to note that Docker containers use bin sh dash c command to run whatever is in CMD. So it's gonna run sh. It has to. It also runs it in the build. So we're going to look at my infection here. This super elite hack source stuff. Oh man, I stole this straight off a of Stack Overflow. Um, this is just so that I can find a, a, a process by, uh, by its name um, so that I don't start up multiple versions of my shell. And here's the good stuff. Bam. See if you can find it. You see it? Line 253. That's it. It calls p open. That's it. It's not hard. <laughs> like this is going to spawn a process uh, called user bin watchdog. We're going to store a file there. That's bad. That's going to be our reverse shell. Um, and uh, every time sh runs, it's going to check and see if it's already running the watchdog. If it's not, it will run it. So easy. This is not hard. This is just in the main command loop. And uh, yeah, this took like two hours to figure out. It's it's not hard. Now we can be a lot sneakier than this. Um, like I mentioned, we could put stuff into libc. Um, but uh, honestly, I don't know that it's that important most of the time. People don't look inside their containers at what processes are running. <laughs> um, and if they do, it's very easy for them to go, oh, there's a process running called watchdog. Man, those SREs are really looking out for me. They got a watchdog in my container. That's perfect. <laughs> Particularly since they've imported this base container from somewhere that they don't know, and they don't know what's running in it. They didn't look at the Docker file. They just imported it, and they're using it. Um, so yeah, be sneaky like if you're doing this for real, but uh, if you're trying to demo this for engineers, don't bother. Just do this. I'm using Herschel as a reverse shell. I mentioned this simply because I wanted to give them credit because it's a sweet program um, and because it uses uh, a SSL certificate pinning, um, which I uh, thought was really cool for running in a production environment, um, making sure that no one else is going to swipe my shell. Right. Let's do a demo of how this works. You all see that okay? Yeah, totally. All right. So first we're going to demo uh, putting in the exploit into a container. Right. So we've got our folder here. We've got evil sh, which is our pre-built infected dash binary. I'm not going to make you sit through the compilation. Um, and we have Herschel, which has been built with our uh, C2 all set up. Oh, and I got to run the C2. Yeah. There we go. Super fancy C2. All right. So we're going to do this. Docker run. And we'll just start with an Ubuntu. All right. Oh, I did forget something important there. So we're going to use dash V to mount our current directory into the container. We'll go there. And we'll copy this in. And we'll copy this in. And oh my god, we're done. Done deal. Infected. Holy crap. Um, we're going to save this, right? Come over here. I see this running container here. That's us. Stretch this out a little bit. There we go. And we'll do docker commit doink. 
and we'll bind it to our, this is our, remember, our registry that's running, right? And company name, base Ubuntu. And we'll do Docker push. There. Done. So uh, that was really easy, right? Took a long time. <laughs> Uh, very, very, very uh, uh, sophisticated technical stuff there. Not, not hard at all. Um, and, and I'm making that point because I want to like, I think that sometimes people think that these attacks are really, really uh, hard to do and that you have to be a super genius to figure this out. You don't, you really don't. This is so easy. Um, and this will show up in the Docker history. And uh, if you're doing IOCs for this, like look through Docker history, um, catch Alex's talk if you are interested in how to do that, um, it will show up there. Um, but this won't show up in the Docker file um, and engineers assume that whatever is in the Docker file that their CI built is what's in the image, and they don't even think about it. Um, we're going to demonstrate what happens when you run this. And actually, the cool thing is, is that the build will also run our exploit. So we have this service called return 200. I'll show you what the service does real quick. It returns 200. And we'll look at the Docker file. And this is a very typical, this is what a Docker file will look like for a service that you're trying to infect. And as you can see, they're importing our base container that we infected here, right? So we will do, do we have our C2? We got our C2, okay, we're good. Docker run. Oh man. You're watching me type. There we go. And as you can see, we're running the container here. And we got shell. Woohoo. We can check out our environment here. Look at stuff. And one thing I did want to show is uh, during the Docker build, it also emits shells. So we'll do Docker build dash f Docker file dash t return 200 dots. And as you can see, yeah, we're inside of the Docker build. And um, if you pause processes here, like if we pause app get y update, which is what the Docker build was running, um, well, let's see if we can, mm, I think it's kill, eh, I don't remember what kill command it is. Um, so I won't screw it up. But uh, we can pause it there, and the Docker build will just hang out. And uh, if it's like running in Jenkins, that means the Jenkins build just like chills for forever and just pauses. And um, that's one way to get a developer's attention is to pause their Jenkins build for three hours while you're poking around. Um, but if you're quick and if you script it, uh, you can just uh, like start hitting APIs, start stealing environment stuff. Oftentimes, people will pass really good stuff to their uh, to their Jenkins builds um, because the, their builds need databases or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, oftentimes the build environment will also be on a cool network segment that might have interesting stuff. Um, so it's really cool to check out what's in the build environment first. Um, but yeah, so this will get built, it'll get pushed out, and then the orchestration will deploy it. Um, what do I do now that I'm in? Figure out where you are. So uh, you might be in multiple places. And I recommend definitely using C2 that will handle multiple connections for you um, because you will probably end up in at least two places most of the time. Um, and you may end up in completely different countries. So uh, figure out, A, whether you're in a container. Um, there are people who have gone over this at length, um, uh, but uh, I just check the host name. Usually if the host name's a hash, I'm probably in a container. Um, and uh, you check out what's running there. Um, do PS, figure out what service it is. Um, and uh, the other thing that I would look at immediately is uh, look for secrets. Um, ENV is great. People often will inject secrets into uh, shell environments at runtime with Docker containers. Um, this is like a very common use pattern. Um, so just run ENV, you'll get secrets. Um, uh, there are also container orchestration things that will mount files to the file system. So check out mount, um, uh, check out uh, anything. Um, and uh, definitely do your homework on what people are using at your uh, given target. Uh, see if you can figure it out. Uh, Looking at their job, job listings might help. Um, and uh, yeah, 
uh, AWS credentials are often really common there. Um, try and see what you can do with those. Um, and uh, I would poke at the kernel as well to start. Um, see if they patched their stuff or not. Because if they didn't, you might be able to get host execution really easy that way. Um, but the really good stuff is just by making HTTP requests to freaking everything. Um, and uh, one thing that I found is that in these environments, there's often information that's available for free. Um, and that containers have a lot of privileges to information about the environment because they need to figure out what they need to connect to. Um, because everything is dynamic, um, they often need to use some other service to do that. Most people call this service discovery. Um, there are uh, uh, open source solutions for this, uh, but often people will build their own stuff. Um, so go out and try and find this. Um, do nmap scans, grab banners, and then just like start making requests to things. And go and look at the images that you downloaded from the registry and see if you can identify, oh, that service is running here. I know what the source code is for that. I can look at what it's doing. I can get it to do stuff for me. Um, container orchestration APIs. Oh, geez. So people leave these open. Um, Kubernetes has had this, and it's been in the news a bunch. This is the same issue as the, uh, as the Docker socket being open on the daemon. Um, you can do stuff, and uh, people often do not secure these. Um, so learn how to use them, learn how to find them, and find them. Uh, Marathon is very popular. Kubernetes is very popular. Um, there are many others. Uh, find those. They're real good. Um, cloud metadata URLs are similar to this. Uh, there have been, you know, check out Hakaroni uh, about a lot of issues with uh, SSRF getting chained into uh, metadata URL access in AWS or uh, Google Compute Engine. Um, you can also do that from these really easy. Um, and uh, I think it's important to note that most things are proxied in uh, these environments. So the host is mounting, it, it is forwarding a port on the host into the container's network namespace. And uh, usually it pushes out or makes available some configuration for some proxy to use to then uh, set up a, a virtual IP and uh, a DNS name and uh, forward the traffic from usually port 80 or 443 into the special port on the container. So get used to messing with host headers and trying different stuff. Um, do your research. Um, Trafic is one that's really, really popular. Um, with folks, um, and uh, it actually works really good and it's pretty secure, but uh, people do their own stuff. See if you can find the container that holds it and see if you can see what they're doing for middleware, um, definitely. Okay, how do I deal with this? Uh, access control and authentication for important APIs is a good place to start. And you think like, oh, you know, Josh, this is, this is dumb. People are definitely not going to just run those without passwords on them, they will, they do. They definitely do. And they don't do it because they're dumb. They do it because secrets are hard in dynamic environments. Um, it's not easy to authorize and authenticate the various services that they have running that need to be able to push things into registries, that need to be able to pull things down. Um, and uh, there's a lot of value in this culture on being able to move fast, not having friction. Um, it's really easy for folks to see authentication as friction to getting done what they need to get done. And uh, I think that there's not a great understanding of the threat model and of how this can actually work. Um, so people don't do it. Um, people don't do it. And if people are just putting a set of credentials, LDAC credentials, in front of their Docker registry, then you're one set of credentials away from Ponage. If it's still sitting on your you know, corp network and that's all you did with it, I don't think that you're really like, really digging into what the throttle model actually represents. Um, I think that uh, people should be running these on isolated network segments if at all possible. I think that you should have very strict access control lists. And I don't think that anyone except for the CI, the place where the Docker container got built, should be able to push there. And this is all possible to do. Um, you should do threat models and attack simulations on your CI and on your developer tools. This is something that like gets overlooked. Um, people do a really good job of testing their uh, products that go to their customers, um, but then often the developer tools, because they're behind the VPN, people don't think about them, uh, and people don't threat model them. Uh, definitely do this. You will find good stuff. Um, use Docker Notary, and uh, Docker Notary is not great. It's okay. Uh, Docker Notary doesn't actually sign images as I understand it, what Docker, what Docker Notary does is it, it signs a 
commit to a registry. So the person who pushes that stuff up to the registry, they sign when they committed it, and the commit has the hash of the image that they that they wanted on it. The image itself doesn't have any signature attached to it. So it's only like the only way to validate it is to ask the registry where it came from. Hey, is this cool? Um, it's better than nothing, though. And there are uh, um, proprietary uh, solutions to this. Um, there may be some ways to do it uh, that I'm not thinking of, um, but uh, and Docker will sell it to you and give you support for it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that people, you really need to think about where your images come from um, and who built them and when they were pushed there. Um, and you should patch your stuff. You really should patch your stuff. Um, the, uh, the kernel is a huge attack surface. Um, and uh, you can do a lot to limit what containers can do, but unless you patch your stuff, it's not going to help. Um, and uh, patch levels inside containers often fall behind, and that's where we—that's kind of the you know the, the first step of attacking these things. Um, if you can get code execution inside a container because you were uh, running an out-of-date version of a library, uh, you can use all the post exploitation stuff right there. It's really easy. I will talk a little bit about SecComp and SE Linux. Um, this limits what processes can do inside of a host. Uh, SecComp is really cool. It whitelists uh, system calls to the kernel. Um, there are some system calls that have to be blacklisted, or that have to be denied, because otherwise uh, Docker security wouldn't work at all, <laughs> and that's why it exists. Um, but you can whitelist uh, as many or as few syscalls as you want. Um, this is gr a great idea, um, and, uh, and, it's, and it's really cool. Uh, but I think that unless you are at a place of maturity where you are, you know, protecting your stuff, um, unless you are have a really good story around the uh, sanctity of your images, uh, I, d I don't know that this is going to help. And uh, it's useful for mitigating kernel attacks, but it doesn't stop me from making HTTP requests in general because what else is a Docker container going to need to do other than like make HTTP requests to other Docker containers? That's the whole architecture, like. If you're going to have to whitelist the stuff that I care about, right? Um, and uh, yeah, make sure that you've done all of the basics before you start pushing on this for people. Um, this is a good slide. Collaborate early, and this is really difficult. Um, I think that uh, it is difficult for security people to make their voice heard in the uh, in the early architecture conversations that people have when they're setting this stuff up. Um, and often what happens is, is that people will set stuff up, it'll be a test, it'll be something that they're playing with, and then it'll immediately, you know, that, that becomes production now. And all of the, uh, the loosey-goosey stuff with the APIs uh, becomes just the way we do things. Um, and uh, once someone has built automation around that, you're really screwed um, because it becomes a lot more onerous to figure out how to fix it. Um, so you should go get in, involved early um, and make sure that you, uh, you know, do training with your engineers. Figure out what they're actually working on. Ask them questions and uh, it, understand the problems that they're trying to solve. Because the problems that they're trying to solve are not easy. It's not as easy as just saying, like, put, put authentication on that. Like, you have to have a plan for, well, how do you manage secrets? What's a safe way to manage secrets? Um, and secrets is a huge part of how to make this work right. Uh, a lot of people have talked about secrets management in dynamic environments uh, that are better at it than I am. Um, so I will refer you to them. Um, Turtles all the way down is a good thing to look up. Uh, there's someone at Netflix uh, that gave a talk about uh, how they do um, secrets management. TLDR, uh, signed attestations provided by AWS. So, you know, pass off your Turtles to AWS and let AWS do it. Um, I think that is a pretty solid solution, um, but uh, it's one thing to say it and another thing to implement it. Um, this is a long-term project, and it is a dependency for this kind of orchestration work. So get in on it. Um, and uh, yeah, you should threat model stuff often because it's going to change a lot. They will change directions often, um, and they will discover new problems with what they're doing often, and uh, they will have tight timelines to fix them. Um, so you really need to pair. You need to be embedded, and uh, you need to threat model their stuff continuously as they come up with new ideas. So let's say you are past that stage and they're already running stuff and it's not secure. What do you do? Um, I think that doing the purple team thing is a really good way to do it. Um, and it's one thing if, uh, you know, because 
anyone you hire to do penetration testing should like already know about all this stuff and be able to tell you immediately. Like, you left your Docker sockets open. You need to fix that. Um, it has a lot of impact if you yourself go and exploit these issues for your engineers. If you are embedding with engineers and trying to help them do Docker security, being in the habit of doing write-ups for them, showing them what you're doing, explaining how it works, uh, can really, really get their attention and uh, have a real impact on them because they conceive, okay, it's not super genius hackers that we hired to do a pen test that did this. It is people who like me. There's, you know, it's just Josh. He's just like an engineer. He doesn't. He's not a super genius. He has a similar background to me. He comes from the same place. I understand him, and uh, he walked through this with me. And I and I understand. Oh, I could have found this. I could have figured this out. Um, and uh, ask them to think evil with the post exploitation stuff, and go. Well, what would you do if you were, if you were in a container and you were in our environment? How would you wreck our? wreck our day. And uh, they will come up with some great stuff. They will come up with really good stuff because they know where the bodies are buried. Um, and uh, if you can like engage them in a conversation that's getting them to talk about that stuff um, instead of a conversation where they're defensive, that's really, really good. Um, and uh, yeah, like show them that you're on their side. You know, I think a lot of times, a lot of times the, uh, the, the discourse around these kinds of issues that are, you know, no brainer issues uh, isn't very helpful. Um, and uh, definitely, like, take attack of being helpful. Take attack of understanding the business use case for what they're doing, and uh, help them compromise and figure out what to do. So, in conclusion, Docker is powerful and exploiting it is powerful. It's real good stuff. Um, and the historical issues are still exploitable in many cases. Um, you will find this stuff. Um, you need to be very careful with images, with build environments, and with registries. And uh, you should be demoing these risks for your engineers and showing them what's up. Cool. Does anyone have any questions? No? Sweet. Oh, right here. What's up? Sure. Um, the question is, is uh, so I talked about base images a little bit and how it's a little bit of an anti-pattern. Um, how can I deal with that? Um, I deal with it by copy-pasting stuff, honestly. Um, and I think that like in a lot of cases, so what people are trying to do is they're trying to save themselves work. Um, and I think that the pattern of doing a base image works really well for things within a specific project that have shared dependencies. Um, but it also serves uh, engineers really well to understand what their dependencies actually are and how to bootstrap a, uh, a Docker container for it. Like, it's not, you know, it's installing some packages and doing some configuration, and I think it's, like, reasonable to, and expect them to be able to do that, and and and, uh, and I, I think that when we talk about, like, do engineers need to understand the orchestration stuff? Do they need to, like, really get into how Docker works? Not necessarily, but they should know how to, like, from a image that has been signed uh, that's in the, the library in the Docker Hub. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that you will repeat things. You will install a lot of the same packages. You should just put those in the Docker file. And I think that like Docker files that are one Docker file that go all the way down are really easy to read, they're really easy to reason about, and easy to debug. Because then you don't have things happening in a binary image over here that you need to go discover. So um, yeah, does that answer your question? Any other questions? What's up? Uh, it's kind of crazy because the so the Docker registers don't have any authentication by default. Yeah, so. correct. And so what are the options for logging them down and how hard is that for companies that can't? Sure. Um uh so the Docker registry does have uh, some hooks for um, doing, I believe it's LDAP authentication. Um, I uh, and they'll sell it to you. That's the easiest way is to buy it from them. Um, uh, I've also seen folks uh, put stuff in front of registries, uh, like like doing uh, HTTP password with LDAP. Um, again, I don't think that authentication is really the end-all be-all of protecting the registry. Like if it's you know one set of credentials away from getting pwned, like that's not solving the problem. Um, and uh, yeah, I think like really the way to deal with the problem is to use Docker Notary and do signed commits. And I think that like you know. You should think about 
you should think about it exactly the same way you think about your source code. Um, like we have 2FA on our source code. We, we are pretty crazy about uh, checking the logs and making sure that stuff is good there, like do the same thing with the registry. Um, and uh, you, you know, it's HTTP. So you can proxy it and you can look at the access logs and you can see when people are pushing things and you can do alerting on that as well, so. Any other questions? No? Cool, thank you. <laughs>